Inclusive and equitable HIV prevention and care planning is an essential part of promoting health equity and responding to the changing demographics of the HIV epidemic. The recently released Integrated HIV Prevention and Care Plan guidance for 2022 to 2026 speaks to the need for equitable HIV planning, highlighting how the achievement of national goals and the epi epi epidemic is intrinsically linked to the elimination of existing health inequities. During today's webinar, our colleagues from Health HIV will present the ways in which power imbalances can manifest in HIV planning bodies. And we're also extremely privileged to have presenters representing the Colorado Health Network and Los Angeles County on how their planning bodies sought to promote equity and strategies that can be implemented to foster equity and mitigate power imbalances based on race, education, age, and SES status. Next slide, please. We'll be answering questions at the end of the call. We'll answer as many um, as time permits, and I'm sure you're all very familiar with, with Zoom at this point, but if you have any questions during the call, you can submit them through the Q&A feature. And I will also wanted to mention that after our webinar ends, an evaluation will pop up, and we thank you in advance for filling this out as it helps to inform future webinars and trainings. Next slide, please. So we hope that you're familiar with the IHAP TAC, but just in case, we're a HRSA HAB TA Center funded to support Ryan White HIV AIDS program parts A and B recipients and their respective planning bodies with overall, um, overall integrated planning efforts, as well as implementation and monitoring and now development of their integrated HIV prevention and care plans. We provide both national and one-on-one -on -one TA and training activities and we're led by JSI with our partner, Health HIV. Next slide. As I'm sure many of you have seen on June 30th, June 30th, HRSA and CDC jointly released the Integrated HIV Prevention and Care Plan guidance for calendar year 2022 through 2026, which outlines the planning requirements for all Ryan White Parts A and B recipients and DSHAP funded state and local health departments. Next slide, please. So the expectations uh, that CDC and HRSA have that Part A and Part B recipients and DSHAP funded state and local health departments will continue to use existing integrated HIV prevention and care plans, as well as other jurisdictional plans, such as ending HIV epidemic plans or fast track cities, as their jurisdictional HIV roadmap until the submission of the new integrated plan, which will be due in December 2022. Many jurisdictions have already developed EHE plans or other plans, and CDC and HRSA encourage jurisdictions to use ex existing um, Append, use the appendices and checklists included in the guidance for instructions on how to leverage existing EHE documents to satisfy submission requirements. Next slide, please. We are compiling an FAQ um, on the updated guidance. And so if you have any questions on this updated guidance, um, we encourage you to submit them to us. Next slide, please. So we are available to provide uh, TA and training on integrated planning and the development of plans. And we'll be launching some new TA opportunities and training materials soon to help you develop your integrated plan. So please stay tuned. Next slide, please. So following the webinar, so getting back to the webinar, um, we hope that um, after the webinar, you'll be, um, we'll be able to discuss ways in which power imbalances can manifest in HIV planning bodies understand how other planning bodies have sought to address implicit bias and promote equity, and identify strategies that can be applied to their own planning body to foster equity and mitigate power imbalances. Um, now I would like to hand over the presentation to our Health HIV colleague, Marissa Tonelli, who is the Director of Health Systems Capacity Building for Health HIV, and will introduce herself and the rest of the colleagues. Marissa? Good afternoon, everyone, and good morning for the West Coast uh, folks. Um, just wanted to quickly introduce my team from Health HIV that supports the Integrated HIV AIDS Planning TA Center, um, and we'll be kicking off and facilitating the conversation with the two HIV planning bodies we have invited here today. As Julie mentioned, I'm the Director of Health Systems Capacity Building at Health HIV and also Health HIV's lead on our IHAP TAC collaboration. Good afternoon or good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Eve Kelly um, and I'm the Senior Capacity Building Assistance Project Coordinator at Health HIV. Um, and I've had the opportunity to work with Marissa pretty closely on the IHAP project for the last couple of years. Hi everyone, thanks so much for joining us. My name is Grace Hazlett and I'm a Capacity Building Fellow with Health HIV. 
Um, and I've spent the last year working with Marissa and Eve on some IHOP TAC activities. So really um, happy that you all are able to join us today. Thank you. So today on our agenda, um, a few things that we wanted to discuss is really to first and foremost, characterize some of the power imbalances uh, that happen in HIV planning and their impact on the effectiveness of HIV planning. We'll review some findings from a 2021 planning body assessment that Health HIV conducted, uh, findings that were related specifically to equity. Um, and then we'll also discuss some equity and inequity related challenges experienced by two unique HIV planning bodies um, and the strategies they've implemented to address those inequities. So as we mentioned, we're joined by two uh, planning bodies today and very excited to hear um, from them. And we'll finish with a live Q&A. Uh, as Julie mentioned at the very beginning, the health HIV facilitators and um, also our presenters from Colorado and Los Angeles County um, will be available for Q&A. Um, we ask that you submit them to the Q&A uh, section in this, uh, during the session, and then when we'll do the live Q&A, we'll be able to answer a majority of those questions, um, time permitting. Just so everybody knows this slide deck, um, and the recording of the webinar will be archived on the IHAP TAC, uh, by the IHAP TAC, I should say, on the Target HIV website. So you will have access to this and uh, we can provide more information following uh, the webinar. So I'm going to turn it over to Grace. Thank you, Marissa. Um, so for the purposes of this webinar, we thought it was important to define power imbalances within the context of HIV planning. Um, and throughout this presentation, the term power imbalances will refer to disproportionate influence of some members over others um, due to race, gender identity, sexual orientation, education, age, geographic location, um, socioeconomic status, et cetera. Um, and it may also refer to the inaccessibility and technicality of policies, procedures, terms, and structures that can create barriers to understanding and can foster elitism as well. Um, next slide, please. Um, so when having these conversations, it's also critical that we distinguish between efforts to foster equality and efforts to foster equity. Equality exists when each individual or group of people is given the same resources or opportunities. Equity, on the other hand, recognizes that each individual has different circumstances and it allocates the exact resources and opportunities that are needed to reach an equal outcome. Next slide, please. Um, so before transitioning into the rest of our presentation, um, we'd like to get a sense of your experiences with power imbalances in HIV planning. Um, please use the polling function to answer the following question. How significantly do power imbalances affect your ability to conduct effective HIV planning? And so the poll function should have popped up on your screen. Um, if you could fill it out, that would be wonderful. Maybe in a few moments we can end the polling function um, and review the results. Great, thank you. Uh, thank you to everyone who participated in that. So it looks like 42% um, of you all that indicated that um, power imbalances strongly impact um, your ability to conduct effective HIV planning um, with 22% uh, saying slightly impact, um, and then 18% saying very strongly impact. So I think that just goes to show that this is a really important conversation to be having.
Great, thank you, Grace. Um, certainly interesting, especially that only 2% um, said that it, it does not impact or, or uh, only slightly impacts. So that's, that's great to see. Um, one of the things that we just wanted to put forth um, as um, some background and kind of a stage setting for this conversation is the fact that there are many policy data and landscape factors that are impact, um, impacting HIV planning equity. Of course, there's the need for more effective, more efficient planning um, with the ending the HIV epidemic in the US. Um, some jurisdictions received additional resources for planning. They also have additional deliverables um, and that can create some inequity within jurisdictions um, or within states. Um, the HIV epidemic also has changed a lot um, in terms of the demographics over the past two decades. HIV infections are, of course, disproportionately impacting people of color, primarily Blacks and African Americans, and even new HIV uh, diagnoses are highest among people ages 25 to 29. Um, so, of course, considering uh, those demographics within your planning body um, and, of course, uh, highlighting and elevating those voices is, is more important than ever. Um, also since March, 2020 with the COVID-19 pandemic, most planning bodies have transitioned to an all virtual engagement. Uh, this of course impacts participation among people without access to technology, um, individuals who are simply not tech savvy. Um, and also there's ADA accessibility concerns as well. Um, so what um, individuals with disabilities are able to access or how they're able to access on a virtual platform. And then the social justice movements uh, like the Black Lives Matter movement protesting against police brutality, uh, racially motivated violence against Black people, um, extremely important in how they changed the dynamic or certainly changed um, some of the emotions that people, individuals in planning bring to the table um, and concerns that individuals bring to the table around the HIV epidemic and these social justice movements. Again, more important than ever in impacting planning equity. And I'll talk just a little bit about the integration of, of planning bodies as well. So with integrated planning, we know uh, this began a, a quite a number of years ago um, in the first iteration of the integrated HIV prevention and care planning guidance. But another factor on power imbalances and equity is language and the ability of different planning body members to communicate effectively. Uh, certainly when you're um, integrating prevention, HIV prevention and HIV care, um, whether it is part A planning or part B planning, um, they are accustomed to different terminology, different acronyms. Um, and again, can create a power imbalance um, with individuals that might have um, more understanding of certain terms, acronyms, or even policies. Funding as well um, is a factor as the planning body may be driven primarily by uh, the HRSA Part A policies, which is uh, legislatively mandated. And of course, um, time and responsibilities is another factor some bodies um, maybe did not increase meeting time or occurrences as responsibilities expanded for EHE um, or for integration um, among planning, uh, the two different planning structures or three different planning structures, depending on how a jurisdiction uh, may have integrated. So we know ultimately that, and, and most importantly, that engagement of planning body members impacts the effectiveness um, and the outcomes of HIV planning. And so ultimately, this is our goal to um, engage in this discussion today and talk about how we can improve that engagement by um, addressing the power imbalances and inequity. Awesome, so I'll take it from here. Um, thank you, Marissa and Grace. Um, so this is this slide we built um, after um, working with planning bodies for the last couple of years and having the chance to go through um, an assessment process with them to hear about how different structures and um, things like equity play into their ability to operate effectively as planning bodies. Um, and so this is provides some context around um, word from the field and th that was directly shared with us from planning body members um, about different challenges that they're facing uh, when it comes to equity. So um, just to give a brief overview, some of the 
themes that we noticed um, coming up pretty consistently um, with, of course, very varied um, depending on the planning body we were talking to, but it was something that we saw kind of across the board as impacting planning bodies in different ways. So um, the first one that we noticed, which really speaks to what Marissa was just touching on, is just in general the inaccessibility um, and the dense language that's used in policies and procedures. Um, and so just the over-intellectualization of processes that makes it um, much harder for folks who don't have planning experience to come into these bodies and participate in a meaningful way. Um, and so we heard um, from a number of sites that new member orientation had really limited engagement um, and kind of, especially moving into the virtual world was kind of just a, a dump of really dense information um, coming very quickly and I was very jargon heavy and complex. Um, and so there wasn't, and moving forward, there weren't meaningful check-ins with new members to kind of help um, alleviate some of that barrier of entry in terms of accessibility. Um, likewise, we saw kind of an overemphasis on some formal processes and procedures. So things like parliamentary procedure, um, that was just kind of this whole new language um, that folks had to learn coming in and people who didn't have exposure to that in other settings were kind of at a disadvantage in that regard of not feeling um, like they were allowed to or knew how to kind of begin engaging in discussion without those formal um, systems of language um, that others were using to communicate. Um, likewise, we saw that there was um, some in some planning groups uh, members noted that they felt that speaking time was really dominated by certain members, um, as well as um, those members also kind of promoting condescending behavior or um, even structural barriers like misogyny and racism um, that, of course, strained inter-member relationships and also just made it much harder for um, folks to be able to participate meaningfully when they felt that their um, participation wasn't valued or even wanted or welcomed in a space. Um, and so kind of paired with all of that was um, some groups really struggled to engage consumers in their planning. So even those who were on planning bodies, um, if they didn't feel welcome or they didn't feel like they knew how to even communicate in or speak up in meetings um, that their voices were being left out. Um, so that's something that we heard from different planning bodies um, across the country, uh, as well as kind of, um, and this was not the case in all of them, and it was really interesting to hear um, how different groups were approaching it, but um, some, some folks uh, reported back that there was kind of an avoidance or a tendency to shy away from having really direct discussions about things like racism and how it's impacting planning work that made it much harder um, to address those issues if they weren't being um, talked about. So we won't spend too much time on this question at the bottom, but I do just want to throw it out there for you all to think about. Um, and you're welcome to put any thoughts into the chat box as we continue on with the presentations. But um, what power imbalances or inequities in planning are you experiencing? Uh, we saw that um, the most frequently answered um, response in our poll question was that this is having an impact, um, at least to some extent, for most of you. So we'd be very interested to hear if you have any experiences that you want to share in the chat box, feel free to do so. Um, or you can just continue to reflect on this as we carry on. But I think I will I'll transition over to our presentation. So if you go to the slide, next slide, Marissa. Awesome. So as Marissa and others have said, we have uh, members from two different groups with us today to speak a little bit more about their experience with inequity and in planning, as well as what they're, they're all doing to um, address these structural issues going forward. Um, so first, we're going to hear from Deja and Chris from the 5280 Fast Track Cities Task Force in Denver, Colorado. Um, after them, we'll hear from Don, Cheryl, and April from the Los Angeles County Commission on HIV. But I'll go ahead and pass it over to Deja and Chris to properly introduce themselves. Yeah, thank you, um, Eve, so much. Um, my name is Deja Moore. Um, I'm the Colorado Department of Public Health and Environment Comprehensive Human Sexuality Education Program Coordinator, so it's CHEESE for short. 
um, but I'm also the community activation work group lead for Fast Track Cities in Denver. And my name is Christopher Zivilich. Um, he and his pronouns. I am the director of a public, wow, director of public health interventions uh, at the Colorado Health Network. And I'm one of the co-chairs, the non-clinical community co-chair of the 5280 Fast Track Cities Task Force. So while Deja and I, um, while Deja works at the State Health Department and I work for a large ASO, we are specifically representing our roles on this task force um, and HIV planning body in this particular conversation. Um, so thank you. And next slide, please. Just want to do a quick little overview of what Fast Track Cities Denver is all about. Some of you may be very familiar with the Fast Track Cities Global Initiative that came out in response to the Paris Declaration and in pursuit of achieving and exceeding the 90-90-90 goals, uh, right, that 90% of people living with HIV are diagnosed, 90% of them are linked to treatment, and 90% of them have uh, viral suppression rates uh, or have been virally suppressed. Um, so here is a little quick overview of how the Fast Track Cities Denver, when we signed on to this initiative, uh, what our strategic framework looked like and how we planned that out over the last couple of years. So we cover five different geographic focus areas. Um, four out of the five are in the Denver Metro, counties within the Denver metropolitan area. Um, I think according to the most recent census, it's just under 3 million people who are in the Denver Metro area. So that's about half of the entire population of Colorado. So that is understandably so why that's a large focus for our Fast Track Cities initiative. But we do also cover the non-Metro Denver area as well um, to account for especially a lot of the rural communities in our state. Colorado is a huge state with a lot of rural communities that are also included in our strategic framework. Um, we ultimately have two goals that are combining care and prevention, um, sustainable, equitable, and comprehensive care and prevention, and making sure that both are widely available. Uh, in our strategic framework, we came up with eight indicators to be able to assess whether or not we are achieving those two goals. So we have those listed here, late diagnosis, linkage to care, engagement in care, viral suppression, disparities, access to PrEP and NPEP, uh, comorbidities and communication, and also in alignment with the Fast Track Cities Global Initiative, we aim to eliminate stigma in our communities. That is obviously a very challenging, complex, and overarching goal, but we thought it made sense to have that a part of our strategic framework so that an anti-stigma lens is always incorporated in the work that we do. Um, and to explain a little bit about this HIV planning body, we have over 100 members who have at some point touched uh, the Denver Fast Track Cities Task Force. They've participated in some way. That doesn't necessarily mean that they've participated in some of our work groups or some of our more day-to-day -day, um, work that demands some more time and attention, but it really has been a coalition of ASOs and, and HIV service providers, a lot of physicians and medical providers, as well as some community members, although we're going to be talking a lot about today the way that we have failed in some ways to meaningfully engage a lot of community members who are not paid professionals in the HIV field, which I think is um, a huge issue that speaks to what has already been talked a lot about today so far. Um, and then we have 10 individuals who serve on the steering committee. That includes Deja and myself. Um, I'm the non-clinical co-chair. And then we do have another clinical co-chair or have a clinical co-chair who is a pharmacist uh, here in Denver. So I went through this part really fast, but I just want everyone to have a little bit of an outline of what the Denver Fast Track Cities Task Force is. Um, and we do work in partnership with a lot of the other HIV plan planning bodies throughout the state of Colorado. And we're gonna talk a little bit about um, what that's looked like when it comes to issues in inequities, um, which leads us to our next slide. Yeah, so I think it's important, right, with one of our goals being for folks living with HIV to really have access to quality care and services is we have to address the root causes of inequities and disparities, right, within our community. Um, and specifically in Denver, what we see, and, and also Colorado, I should say, is there's a large disproportionate rate for black and brown folks um, particularly the Latinx um, and Black communities. Um, we also know our trans um, population and gender diverse folks as well in Denver are disproportionately affected. And, and why is really because of social determinants of health. We know that our communities don't have the access that they need when it comes to housing, education, workforce development, um, you know, and so forth. And I, I think too, we can also address the matter that there's systemic racism often involved within government and also within some of the planning bodies. And so 
that structural racism and white supremacy really prevents our folks of color from speaking out and really addressing those um, health disparities and really trying to articulate a plan that's helpful and insightful to really get at the root cause. Um, and so what we see too is that there's new uh, diagnoses that are higher in the Latinx population across the state. Um, I already touched on, there's a lack of engaged community members in the planning body. So our planning bodies, we have about five in Colorado. There's the Colorado HIV Alliance. There's the Colorado HIV and AIDS Prevention Program. There's the Colorado State Drug Advisory Program. And then there's also Fast Track Cities and the Denver HIV Resources Planning um, Council. And so these five main bodies really help address a lot of the disparities and inequities, but there's still that lack of engagement, which is a problem. Um, what we see too is that there's a high number of Latinx MSM enrolled in our Rapid Start ART program, but there's a low number that participate in the feedback follow-up. Um, and why is that is because there's challenges in recruiting, um, retaining leadership from our people of the global majority communities. And then um, for instance, to one of our planning bodies witness an exodus of black female leadership. So when black females don't feel empowered to share their voice, you know, they're, they're leaving and it's really not showing an environment that's inclusive and equitable. And some more about our communities and just our committees that I touched on is that there is a strong desire to bring community to the table. But again, um, they're not adequate really preparing to agree and seat them and make sure that their needs are being met. So meeting times traditionally have not been in the evening times. That's why folks you know, can't come, they're working. Like how do you expect people to show up to the table if they have jobs and they have to provide for themselves on the table? There's also a lack of planning bodies really devoting time and resources to recruitment. And that's also um, been a huge problem. I'm in the SDAP committee as well, and we have a membership group, and I've been really adamant about trying to shift our times and resources and, and our marketing as far as what that looks like. You know, if our marketing efforts are not inclusive to our communities of color that we're trying to attract our gender diverse folks, how do we expect them to be at the table? And to my last point too, there's kind of this cyclical conversation emphasizing inequity, but there's not a lot of action. And so with the community um, action work group, that's what I'm really being intentional with Chris on is why are we not getting folks to the table? How do we eliminate some of those barriers and really provide the opportunities for these folks to be able to advocate for themselves to really get at the root causes? Oh yeah, next slide please. Um, and this will be uh, both of us chatting about this slide. So um, per the point that Deja just made and kind of in response to what was discussed earlier in this webinar, you know, we've talked a lot about community members who, who come to the table in these planning bodies and are going to be um, experiencing a number of oppressions um, and uh, come with that to the table. And that already makes it complicated to authentically engage them if that's not being recognized and written into the processes. Um, but what we've noticed is in Colorado, we have a large issue with those individuals showing up in the first place. So it's not even that they're just showing up and experiencing racism and misogyny and certain power imbalances. Those power imbalances are preventing those indiv individuals from even coming in the first place to a planning body meeting. Um, and then never mind when they, when they show up and may not want to stay. So this is the part where we talk about some potential solutions. Obviously, we all know that equity work is, is complicated and that no solution is going to be necessarily universal. Um, but we have been working on some really interesting ideas and trying to get buy-in from a variety of folks to make sure that these ideas work well um, in, in an attempt to kind of chip away at these power imbalances in our planning bodies. So through Fast Track Cities at the beginning of this year, uh, we actually offered an anti-racism training and we specifically recruited and marketed the training to yes, people who are a part of the Fast Track Cities Task Force, but also people who don't really show up to the Fast Track Cities Task Force, people in the community or people who sort of had um, a relationship to the planning bodies, but weren't always actively engaged. We wanted those people to come to this training so that we could build more relationships with a, a lot of different community members. Um, and that, that two-part anti-racism series training um, with creative strategies for change was, was really empowering and effective um, and that actually is what we ins inspired us to create the community activation work group. We did use that language from our trainers. Community activation is a part of their four point framework. Um, and so we kind of had two overarching goals with the creation of this group. One was to meet community members where they are at rather than trying to convince them to come to our tables because we have not created very welcoming spaces yet. And that is going to take 
some time to, to do that properly, but we don't want to lose out on prospective community engagement in the meantime. So we're going to go to where they are at. Um, and, by, and by creating a specific group that focuses just on equity and anti-racism and anti-sexism and all the work that comes within that field, we're really allowing ourselves to devote some time and resources to that specific work. Obviously, folks in other HIV planning bodies should be focusing on equity work, but understandably so, that's where it gets complicated because I think as it was mentioned earlier, there's only so much time in certain meetings when you're also you know, making decisions on uh, Medicaid, uh, on Medicaid or on medication access or, or whatever the HIV planning body is pursuing. So we said, you need a group that is literally, this is their job. This is what this group does. Um, but to make sure that it doesn't stay in a silo and stay only within that group, the secondary goal of the community activation work group is that through that, we come up with best practices and we actually go around and share those with all the other HIV planning bodies and come up with, with guidelines and practices and toolkits so that way, those other HIV planning bodies can implement more equitable practices, um, but, there's a, but there's a separate body that's kind of really devoting the time and, and effort and, and resources to figure out what those best practices look like. Um, and this is brand new. We started this at the beginning of 2021. Um, I'm really excited about where it's been going, and we've been meeting regularly to start this process. Um, honestly, one of our first goals is to potentially get funding for a paid position to have somebody um, really help us not only um, market events, but have somebody also uh, to really devote that time in partnership with this group um, to engage the community authentically. We've talked about how the person we hire for this, if we can find funding for it, should not probably be a person who's been regularly attending all these HIV planning bodies. It should be somebody from the community who has that authentic leadership, who's a, who's a real representative, who people listen to. Um, and so that's kind of where our that's kind of where we're going right now. I'm going to pass it off to Deja to talk about what some of our other ideas um, are on this right column here. Yeah, and so um, what we've seen with our five planning bodies is that there's oftentimes a lot of siloing, you know. So there's not a lot of communication between each of the planning bodies and really trying to foster change, and that's really problematic because these planning bodies can't be individualistic, you know, to really address those disparities and inequities like we want them to. So what we're hoping to do with Fast Track Cities in our work group is I'm part of four to five groups. And so I'm hoping to work with this group and the other groups to really foster kind of this cross agency, um, I guess, support program, or I, I guess have conversations really to help drive some of the engagement strategies that we're going to have, you know, towards this initiative. And I think to trying to make sure that we're putting money where it should be. You know, I think money oftentimes has been missed or put in places where, you know, it's it's not had the most, um, uh, you know, impact like it should be. And so really trying to understand our, our funding and where it's going and why, and what's the impact of it within the community. And then two, with this group, if we really want community folks to be there, I'm all about paying people for the emotional labor and their time. And I've talked with Chris about this is, we keep having folks show up to the table that are people of the global majority and we're not paying them. We expect people to give, you know, our time and our effort and our, our strength and just our, our mentality as far as, we, as far as how we address these, um, these systemic issues and especially racism, right? But we're just not paid for it. So I think it's time that we pay our folks. And that's what we're trying to do is if we can get the funding for the, um, I, I guess, like the manager lead um, to help us apply for grant funding to help pay for folks to get to the table, that's one way. And then two, I, I think just making sure people are paid when they're going to these meetings, because eventually we want to empower and train these folks to be able to use their voices with, within each of these planning bodies and really have a good impact. And then to my last point is we have to bridge the gap between providers and patients. And oftentimes providers have always been in the conversation when it comes to reducing HIV, but patients are not, you know, our communities are not, and we have to really prioritize this collaboration aspect and making sure folks get on. And there was a last point I needed to touch on is there's a lot of ageism sometimes within our boards and that prevents our youth and our, our young folks from being at the table. So me as someone that's a young adult being there, I think it's so important that we get more youth voices there to really advocate for, you know, youth needs, young adult needs and everyone that needs to be at the table. Thank you for listening to me and Deja chat about this. I think that's the end of our presentation. And we'll, we're happy to be on for the, the Q&A later.
Yeah, thank you all. Excellent. So we will turn it over to the team from the Los Angeles County Commission on HIV. Okay, great. Thank you everyone for the opportunity to share what we're doing here in Los Angeles County. And I'm really blessed to um, conduct this uh, sharing with Don McClendon and April Johnson and also our colleagues from Colorado. So I'll start off with the next slide just to give very briefly some um, contextual information in terms of our demographic and uh, key HIV uh, metrics uh, to give you an idea of Los Angeles County and how that um, impacts our conversations around equity and social justice. Next slide, please. Okay, so here's the, a map of California and the uh, spot on the bottom there highlights the county of Los Angeles. Um, LA County is vast and diverse in terms of its geographic um, scope and span. Um, within our, our county, we have um, almost 10 million residents and uh, it's also very, very ethnically diverse. Um, within uh, one of the uh, most ethnically diverse uh, in the country. Um, do want to point out that oftentimes, you know, when we see depictions of Los Angeles County in Hollywood or popular media, it's always shown as a very urban um, area, when in fact we have a very large combination of urban, suburban, and rural areas um, where you have um, issues of transportation, as well as dearth of services when it comes to different communities. So those are key areas that just wanna highlight in terms of where we are geographically, but the nature of the, of the characteristic that brings on board and how that might impact uh, where people might identify themselves coming from geographically. Next slide, please. Um, this, these are some key HIV metrics in Los Angeles. You all might have seen this one. Uh, this is from our most recent 2019 uh, surveillance data from our pub, uh, public health colleagues. Um, we have uh, still quite a ways to go in terms of ending the epidemic um, and, and joining our colleagues across the country and making sure that we have a bold in response um, towards ending the epidemic. I do want to highlight the last bullet point there in terms of geographic um, hotspots. There are top three hotspots for HIV in Los Angeles County, Hollywood, Wilshire area, Central, and the Long Beach Health Districts. But what's important to also note is that when we take a look at those specific hotspots and we overlay other public health issues, other chronic disease issues, and other um, um, social determinants of health, we tend to see the same areas of disparities and we tend to see the same areas of communities that are deeply impacted by multiple issues um, across various parts of LA County, not just within um, the key um, centers, but also in um, the more um, rural areas of the county. Next slide, please. And then this is just very briefly um, a, a, a graphical representation of the demographics of the county versus the demographics of people living with HIV. So you'll see on the left-hand side, the Latinx population represents the largest group of individuals in the county, followed by the white community, black men and women, um, which represents 8% of the total county population. However, when you take a look at the demographics of individuals living um, with HIV, we have some clear markers of um, inequities, as you can see, where the, uh, the sizes of the box change significantly. So for people living with HIV, Latinos represent 40% of people living and diagnosed with HIV, followed by white and black males, 16%. Uh, so there's a significant uh, mismatch in terms of population uh, representation versus the burden of disease. Uh, together, those three groups represent more than 80% of people diagnosed uh, with HIV in LA County. So just wanted to set the stage in terms of how those particular data points come into play when we enter spaces as human beings within the planning framework of what we do uh, within the HIV movement. 
So I'll turn it over with the next slide to Don McClendon, who will speak a little bit more about the commission. Thanks, Cheryl. And hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Uh, yes, LA County is unique in all of the best ways, and unfortunately, um, and not so much in all of the, uh, the, the worst ways, especially when it comes to inequities. And so let me give you just a little um, brief history on the commission. We are the Los Angeles County Commission on HIV. We were formed in the late 1990s, early 2000s. I was in high school, so um, this is what I was told. <laughs> um, but the commission was formed under the LA County Department of Public Health. Um, at the time, they were known as the Office of AIDS Programs and Policy. They are now the Division of HIV and STD Programs. And the commission is the Ryan White Park A planning body. And just a little fun fact to throw out there. Um, we have one commission member who was a member at the inception of the commission back in the late 90s, early 2000s, and that's Al Ballesteros. So I just want to give him a, a shout out, and that is an incredible demonstration of what commitment looks like. He is still an active, a very active and engaged commissioner um, today. Um, and so uh, as the commission uh, was formed a couple years later under the Department of Public Health, there were concerns with conflict of interest, whether it was perceived or where there were actual conflicts of interest, especially being under uh, the Department of Public Health who holds the purse strings. Um, there were concerns around the priority setting and resource allocation process. Um, and as a result, the county established the commission as its own autonomous entity under the Board of Supervisor. And so to this day, we are autonomous, we are under the Board of Supervisors, and of course we work closely with our grantee, the Department of Public Health Division of HIV and STD programs. Fast forward a few years, um, especially um, amid the conversation around CARES prevention and understanding that integrating um, prevention and care is the only way that we can, um, in good faith, really address HIV. The commission got married in 2013 after it courted um, the CDC funded prevention planning committee for LA County for about a year, year and a half. The commission and the prevention planning committee merged and we then became an integrated prevention and care planning council um, in 2013. Next slide. So going back to that, you know, LA County is unique in all of the, the best and sometimes worst ways. Um, the commission uh, planning body is reflective of that in that we have um, 51 members. Um, that does not include our alternates, which are around six to eight alternates we currently have. So we're talking about almost 60 members, um, all representing uh, uh, their uh, respective jurisdictions, their communities. And so we have a pretty um, reflective voice at our planning table. Each member is assigned to one of our five standing committees, um, which include our executive committee. Uh, they are uh, our leadership group. Um, we have our operations committee who's um, oversees and manages uh, membership and training. Um, we have our standards and best practices committee that um, develop standards of care um, and best practices, um, assesses service effectiveness. We have our planning priorities and allocations committee, which uh, manages the priority setting and resource allocation process. And then we have our public policy committee that champions uh, legislation and policy initiatives um, uh, for our uh, communities. Um, if that's not enough, we have three caucuses um, that are really designed to create a, a safe space for our more vulnerable populations, which are our consumer caucus, our transgender caucus, and our women's caucus. Um, in addition to that, we have two task forces, the Aging Task Force, and we have the Black African American Community Task Force. And then we'll round it all up with one work group. We have a prevention planning work group. So as you can imagine, um, this is 
an, an enormous amount of work and um, each of these groups meet at least once a month. So that totals maybe around 12 meetings per month um, and over 144 meetings per year. And I lead with that to say that all of that, the work, the meetings, the members are supported by an incredible small but mighty staff. And that's our, our five staff and one academic intern. So let me just give them a shout out. That's Cheryl, um, and that's myself, uh, Carolyn, Jose, Sonia, and Catherine. And so um, that gives you kind of a brief uh, background of who we are. Um, and so I will, um, in the spirit of the Olympics, I will pass the baton to April Johnson. Just real quickly, we, um, in response to the George Floyd murder, um, the racial injustices, we uh, consulted and collaborated with our LA County um, Human Relations Committee, um, I'm sorry, Commission, and providing a training series on how to have um, difficult conversations around race. We figured that we need to establish, establish the fundamentals um, and having these con and learning how to have these conversations before we can really kind of get into the substantive um, stuff. And so April is with us today to share a little bit more about that. So take it Hello away. Hello everyone. My name is April Johnson and I am with the Human Relations Commission um, from Los Angeles County. If we could have the next slide. And so we um, came together to work with um, the Human Relations, um, I'm, I'm sorry, the HIV Commission um, to be able to foster um, equity. Um, and so how we did it was the Human Relations Commission, um, we, we put together a strategy to foster equity within um, the COH is by implementing, I'm sorry, facilitated trainings during monthly commission meetings that focuses on presenting a principle um, or a technique followed up with teaching and application using content from, so you wanna talk about race. Um, we collaborated on that, of course, before, um, and it was the decision of their um, commission um, to use the content from that book. Um, and so far it's been extremely helpful um, in um, guiding them in having candid conversations. Um, the goal is for the commissioners to feel very confident um, to apply these principles and techniques that we teach um, for engaging in constructively candid conversations with peers. Um, this is being accomplished through engaging individuals in facilitating dialogue. We have interactive activities and um, we're teaching six important skills to apply in their interactions with each other. Um, they're, they're acquiring these six skills through workshops and trainings are empathy, um, self-management, managing implicit biases, what it is and how it works, inquiry, um, stages of relationships, and definitely valuing diversity, cultivates the effectiveness practice of equitable inclusiveness and mitigates power imbalances based on race, education, age, and so socioeconomic status. And as a result of implementing these facilitated trainings within the HIV Commission monthly meetings, it further promotes equity and provides commissioners with solutions to respond positively to intergroup conflict. It supports resilience and encourage intergroup solidarity. So that is our role in helping to foster equity within a large planning um, body. Thank you. I'll turn it back over to, um, Don. And I'll turn it to Marissa. Great, thank you guys. Um, well, that was very, very informative. I just wanna thank um, all of our speakers, Chris, Deja, Cheryl, April, Don. Um, I want to ask if anyone has any questions to please use the Q&A function and we'll facilitate a brief um, Q&A session right now. Um, I wanted to just ask, uh, I saw a couple of questions that 
Um, I think the Colorado team answered in the Q&A already, but I thought it might be helpful just to share with the full um, audience members. And that was um, Deja's, I think Deja's comment, excellent comment about, um, you know, compensating members, community members, uh, planning body members for their participation, their time, their energy. Um, and I think Chris, you may have responded, but just wanted to see if there was any other uh, things you wanted to add about how um, a planning body might be able to do that or how you um, were thinking you might be able to fund that type of um, compensation because I think others might be interested in, in that. Yeah, I don't mind adding to that. Um, we've talked, that's been the main focus right now of our, um, one of the main focuses I should say of our community activation group right now. And, Part of the solution is maybe looking for funding that is traditionally outside of the HIV realm. So much of the funding that I think a lot of us are used to is primarily earmarked for funding specific services um, or you know, something that in that realm. So for example, here in Colorado, we've looked at certain foundations that do community driven work and they don't necessarily have a history, all of them at least, of funding HIV or sexual health related work, but a lot of the other work they do is in line with our, our community activation goals. So, and, and they prioritize paying community members to do, to do work. So that's part of our strategy has been, let's apply for something that maybe hasn't had as much of a role in the past in our specific field, but what they fund are the things like community stipends um, that we're looking for. Um, you know, to compensate people for their time. And, um, and that might add to more sustainable funding if we can then demonstrate to the more traditional HIV funders, look at what this does, <laughs> uh, you know, assuming we're successful. Uh, so I, I don't know if I, yeah, Deja, I don't know if you wanted to add anything, but that's kind of my. Yeah, I think, you know, for payment of services, right, it's just, that's like the main priority. But also I think we're, we're, we're missing the point on funding community folks to share their experiences and, and what they're going through and, and maybe develop their own strategies that will be helpful for themselves and for their own community as well. So I think we're trying to shift the model and the way funders, you know, think of funding and how they fund communities. And to Chris's point, you know, there's a foundation here in Colorado that really wants to help the resiliency of black and brown folks within the community. And so because that's a priority for them, we're trying to show these are the systemic issues because of racism and white supremacy. Now, this is why you can dedicate funding to help address this in this one area. That's great. Thank you so much for elaborating on that. Um, one other question uh, for, I guess this is both for Colorado and for um, the Los Angeles uh, County Commission on HIV is you mentioned a number of trainings or sessions that were held with the planning bodies. And I'm curious if maybe you could share with some of the other attendees here how you identified those speakers, um, maybe if there was resources that you access that might be nationally available or um, even a local resource that someone may be able to mirror in their jurisdiction. Um, I think that would be great to just share briefly. I'll take a step for Los Angeles. I think we're blessed. Uh, the Human Relations Commission, they have been uh, providing um, support to address um, communications and human relations issues and um, uh, in the community for many, many years. And so with us, we just felt that it was important to lean on more within existing county resources who are experts in the field and, and also the Human Relations Commission um, has the, had had the opportunity to be a part of the county's um, efforts around um, the anti-racism uh, initiative supported by the board. So it was just staff reaching out to their executive director and, and the conversation started from, from there and had grown into this wonderful um, partnership um, with April and, uh, and the Human Relations Commission. And, and we're gonna lean on them 
for additional resources. We're learning what we need to work on uh, further in terms of um, building positive relationships and confronting a difficult conversation. Uh, we also get feedback from the commissioners themselves or community members about potential speakers or, or a resource and thought partners that we can bring to the table. Yeah, I think as far as Denver and uh, Chris, you can expand upon this too. A lot of the trainings have been like once people are voted in as members for the planning bodies, then they get trained on how the planning body works and how they can use their voice effectively for that planning body. Um, and as far as fast track cities, we know that we did a racial equity training, but it has to go beyond that. And so what we're trying to do with this new model is train community folks um, not necessarily just beyond like how they can use their voice, but what resources are available that they can share within their networks, right? So if we're trying to tackle social determinants of health, you know, maybe provide trainings on housing opportunities, educational opportunities, uh, transportation opportunities, and so forth, and really make sure folks are have that foundational knowledge to bring that into the planning body so that they can be insightful and helpful, you know, when they're advocating for themselves. Excellent. I just have one last question um, that, you know, I think maybe we could answer quickly, which is um, around kind of that a comment that those who are generally in control of funding, whether it's agencies, government entities, or large agencies in a community often have the most say, um, sorry, I'm reading from a chat, but, um, but also are least informed about social determinants of health. Um, and lack understanding of black, brown communities, client experience, et cetera. Um, so this individual asks, do you have any suggestions for how one might go about voicing or conveying the challenges that they see to those key stakeholders or uh, maybe the you know, power or power holders um, in a room? I think that's a really good question and it points to a, <laughs> a very structural, problem. I guess my personal response to that and what I've sort of have seen happen here in Colorado and just what I kind of have tried to invest in myself strategically is, is well, if there are channels for those funders to be able to get that kind of feedback to definitely take advantage of those. But, and I'm not sure if this is the best answer, going to our other point, we're trying to find then other funding sources or, or other bodies that can uh, take those other funding sources to do that work. So I bring up fast tracks again, and that's why I think we're an interesting example. We're not regulated, since we're not a government body, we're not regulated by the same laws or funding restrictions as some of our other planning bodies are. But that doesn't mean that we can't find funding, do some of this work, and then, and then share that information and make sure that it's kind of co-implemented as best as possible with the HIV planning bodies that are, that are going to have more restrictions from their funders and regulators. Um, yeah, I'm not sure if that's if that's kind of getting at what you're asking, but um, it's it's like finding different funding that will listen to us, um, or if there are any particular feedback channels um, for those funders to change the way they limit um, and control the the the, the funding itself, um, and taking advantage of as, as many of those communication channels as possible, I guess. Yeah, and I'll chime in too, like as a trans woman of color as well is. You know, I'm tired of seeing the data continually show the HIV disparities amongst my communities. And I just, I'm showing up to the table. Like I'm going to each of those meetings and I'm really advocating like, why are we not changing the data? The data continues to happen over and over and over and we're not seeing change. So I've been really adamant about just being present and vocal and trying to empower other black and brown folks to be present and show their voices because the people that have control are not gonna move until there's people that show up to the table to really show and advocate for themselves. So I, I say just push back, get those people to rally and get there and they'll, they'll listen, they have to. Great. Um, I think that's an excellent note to end on and a great call to action to Deja. And I just want to, again, thank um, as really incredible and uh, you know, thoughtful panel of uh, individuals from both Colorado and LA. Um, there will be some additional resources that we can share um, in uh, the archived presentation, but since we are at time, I just want to thank everyone so much for attending. Um, please join the IHAP TAC mailing list. 
you can request TA um, at the email address on the screen. Um, and just another reminder that there will be an evaluation pop up um, that we would like everyone to complete. Um, I'll see if anyone else from JSI wants to add anything, but want to thank everyone so much for your time and your participation on today's webinar. Thank you. Yeah, thank you everyone so much for joining us. Have a great afternoon. Thank you guys. Yeah, thank you all too. Thanks so much, April. Thank you all. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Have a great day. I was reminded how massive LA is. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I was that's always a good moment for me to be like, yep, that is a huge county with a lot of stuff. <laughs> yes. <laughs> It is an undertaking. Yes. When so she says 144 meetings a year, uh, that's what catches 